Welcome everyone. It's great to it's great to have you. A couple of things before we start. Um, first, welcome to our seminar series. You know, this work uh, bringing this together wouldn't have been possible without uh, many people who are in the background and may, and ensure that these happen. So you bump into Amanda Riley or Alison Bradley or Peter. You know, give him give him a thumb up. Thank them because they're in the background and they make sure that uh, whatever we do here um, runs smoothly. Second, I want to welcome our new addition to our cost community, Azim, who joined on February as a faculty fellow. Um, you bump into her, talk to her. She does some fantastic research. Um, yeah. So today's speaker, we're excited to have Adam Darnokse, um, from uh, who's a research engineer at the John A. Bloom Earthquake Engineering Center of Stanford University. Adam is a research engineer, uh, where and focus and his work focuses on disaster simulations that support multi-hazard risk assessment and management at a regional scale. Uh, he's the associate director for research outreach at the Nerysim Center where he connects to researchers and practitioners to monitor the state of the art and foster collaboration in the natural hazards engineering community. Adam obtained his PhD in civil engineering at the Budapest University of Technology and Economics and also completed a graduate program at the University of Tokyo. He has experience working at scales ranging from individual structural members through a building to cities with hundreds of thousands of assets. And his research interests include probabilistic natural hazard assessment, model development and calibration for structural response estimation and performance assessment, surrogate modeling and uncertainty quantification in large scale regional simulations and using quantitative disaster simulations to support risk management and mitigation. Today, Adam will uh, present on tackling data scarcity in high risk disaster simulations using machine learning and UQ. Please give a warm round of applause for our speaker. Thank you very much. Does it does the microphone work well? Okay. And you can also use this if you want. This is fine if it works well. Uh, this is convenient for me. I want to show some things on the slides, so it's easier if I can stay near the computer. Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for the warm introduction, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here and present my uh, work to you guys. Uh, as Charlampos told uh, you, I'm going to present about machine learning and UQ techniques we use to tackle data scarcity in high resolution disaster simulations like the one that you can see in the background of the title slide. Before talking about those specific topics, I want to start a little bit uh, farther and remind everyone of all the disasters that happened just during the last year and how these disasters show us that natural hazard risk is still significant around the world. This is not limited to developing countries, this is not limited to a single type of hazard, and this is unfortunately much more frequent than we would like it to be. You can see, you must remember the, the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria just recently, more than 50,000 lives lost, right? Then in the US, we had Hurricane Ian, more than $100 billion of damage. And if you look at Pakistan just last year, you have more than 2 million people displaced in the flooding. These are huge catastrophes and shocks to the communities in the area that will have lasting impact on them, potentially something that can never be repaired. So our goal, our end goal should be to mitigate these risks and try to avoid these things to happen, or at least try to limit the impact of these uh, natural hazard events on our communities. Now, this is not an easy task. These are three examples I, I started with, but if you look at just the United States in 2022, we have 18 disasters that have more than a billion dollar damage in one year. And you can see again that we have multiple types of hazards involved. We have multiple locations. They are nicely covering the country. Basically, there's no place in this country where you wouldn't have some kind of natural hazard risk. The risk changes as you move to different locations, but there's something everywhere. So 
everyone is affected to some extent, but you can also see, especially as I will talk later about the community that traditionally we have been siloed into different areas. So people who were working with a certain kind of hazard were working with their own methods and kind of independently from people who were working on another kind of hazard. And this, this is a, a, an obstacle to improvement, to, in, to innovation in the area, as I will show you later, because these hazards are, have a lot of similarities and there are a lot of synergies between the different methods that we can use uh, to understand them better. The bad news that is that are very concerning is that we not only have a lot of these disasters, but the number of them is increasing over the years. If you look at uh, the number of billion dollar disasters since 1980, you can see a sharp increase and we can expect that this trend will continue. The bars show the number of disasters and this red uh, and black line, the black one is the interesting one. It's a five-year average of the cost involved. And we are looking at $150 billion these days. So this is significant. And if it increases further, there's a point where we will no longer be able to cope with these uh, events by just providing emergency relief and, and financial support to those who are impacted. And we should really focus on preparedness and mitigation of these events. Now, why are these events increasing in frequency and also in magnitude? One of the reasons is climate change. I think nobody in this room uh, doubts that. And if you look at the scenarios that are ahead of us, we are in 2020 right now, we can probably expect something medium or higher. So one of the red lines to, to describe our future, unless there's a significant change in how humanity uh, deals with climate change. And if that is indeed true, we are looking at about two degrees Celsius of increase in global temperatures by 2050. This is nothing uh, new. What's interesting on this slide is the impact of that two degrees increase. Of course, we will have a warmer weather, which is, which is a bad thing in itself. But you can see that we will have significantly more droughts, precipitation, and they say, uh, they expect scientists that we will have more than 13% additional extreme hurricanes and other weather events. That is a significant difference. 13% might not sound like a lot, but that's that many more uh, events that can become another catastrophe or another disaster all around the world. Another interesting fact that uh, is not often advertised is that sea level rise will also be significant, maybe not by 2100, but it's a long-term event. So if you, if you look at this slide closely, you can see that we expect eight meters of sea level rise in over 2000 years. Now we have to prepare for that, of course not in 10 years, but this problem is not going away. So this in itself increases the risk, but there's another component that is very important and that's urbanization. Urbanization has been happening for, for a couple of centuries and we all know that you know, the, the European continent or the United States or Japan uh, is very urbanized People live in cities. In Japan, we have more than 90% uh, of the population living in cities. But what's important and interesting to pay attention to is China, Africa, and India, who are quickly catching up. And that is not going to stop. So if you look at the world, we, we passed the 50% threshold. So more people live in cities than those who are not in cities already. But looking at these important populations, we can expect this trend to continue. And that will exacerbate the situation and increase the risks in the next decades. So rather than expecting to tame these uh, natural hazard events and be able to at least saturate the risk, if we are not changing our strategy, we can expect it to just keep increasing to the point where we will not be able to deal with it. So what can we do? The United Nations has a, an office for disaster risk reduction and they are trying to coordinate and, uh, and help a global response to these events. There are two uh, main thrusts in their strategy, but both of them depend on one important part, the measure of the risks. How do we describe the risks? If we cannot measure it, we cannot quantify it. We, we are not able to monitor our progress. We don't know what we want to reduce. So, we first have to decide what are the important uh, uh, parts of, of the consequences of these disasters that we want to mitigate. And of course, we don't want people to die 
in these events. That's, that's one thing, but there are other impacts that are just as important and oftentimes disasters that do not result in a large number of lives lost still uh, append the lives of millions of people. The UN, uh, this DRR uh, office have four areas that they identified here. Besides mortality, they look at the number of affected people globally by the disaster. They look at economic losses, of course, and they look at the disruption made by the disaster to critical infrastructure and services in the area. So these are the four areas. All of them are defined in a way that is measurable. And then they try to persuade countries to develop strategies, disaster risk reduction strategies. In other words, to understand their risks and do something about it. Uh, and they try and support them with money to develop these strategies and improve their response and preparedness efforts. Now, one uh, issue that is general in uh, disaster risk mitigation, it happens in the US and it was, is also uh, a global phenomenon that most of the money that is available is spent on emergency response. So right now there is more than $1 trillion spent on development assistance to countries, developing countries. Out of that 1 trillion, more than 100 billion is spent on disaster related financing, but only 5 billion is spent on preparedness and prevention. That should change. We need to prepare better, but it's not clear how to change it because we need a lot of money to respond to all of those events that happen around the world today. So there's no clear answer, but understanding the risk is the first step. And these two figures show what, uh, what the UN collected since 2015. This is part of the Sendai framework. So it's a 15 year project. We are eight years into it. And you can see we, they have data from the first five years. I have some problem with the laser pointer because of Zoom. So I will just try to move that. Okay, anyway, you can see it, see it here. This is, this is the chart that we are looking at. The interesting part of, there are two interesting things in this chart. One is that the number of people affected doesn't really decrease over these five years. And that's not really surprising because these changes will have impact on, on communities and the outcomes over the long term. So we don't expect to fix the problems in five years. And the other interesting uh, uh, detail in this figure is that there's more than twice as many people displaced by disasters than conflicts. There are all those wars around the world that displace 10 million people a year and disasters go above 20 million, sometimes even above 30 million people. So this is a substantial and significant impact that needs to be considered at the same level of wars. I think wars are, people are more sensitive to wars and, and more sensitive to, to avoiding uh, wars and, and supporting those who are affected on the long term. Disasters also have long-term effects, five years, 10 years. So we need to think back what disasters happened in the last 10 years and which of those communities still receive our support and help. And the good news, just to say some good news as well, is that through this effort from the Disaster Risk Reduction Office from, from the UN, the number of countries with both national and local disaster risk reduction strategies increased sharply in the last five years. Now we have more than 90 countries in the world that think about disasters and try to do something about it. So this is great. Now, how do we think about the risk? So let's say we identify a certain kind of risk that we want to reduce. How do we calculate that risk? What does it depend on? There are three main components of it. The first one is the hazard. We have to understand the likelihood of different kinds of events, events of different intensity. You can imagine that large earthquakes are less frequent than, than small earthquakes but they are much more destructive. In order to describe the overall risk, we need to know what is the likelihood of different levels of these uh, events. And in most locations, we have multiple types of hazards. So we need to be able to describe their relative frequency also. This tells us only about the hazard. If there's a hurricane in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, there's not gonna be any uh, disaster, right? It's just a hurricane. In order to have a disaster, we need two more things. We need exposure. We need to have people living in the area where the hazard event happens. That is becoming more and more common with these cities that we have all over the place. And 
another part that is important is vulnerability. If you have people living in the area, there is a hurricane, but all of the buildings are really robust and there's no damage, there's no disaster, right? So we need to understand what makes a building or what makes the built environment vulnerable to these catastrophes and how to avoid those vulnerabilities if we want to reduce the risk. First, we did a lot of good work in the last few decades in characterizing the hazards. If we don't understand the hazard, we don't know where to expect these events and we don't know where to uh, fix which kind of vulnerabilities. So when it comes to earthquakes, this is an example from the United States, but similar maps are available all around the world. The entire world is mapped for seismic hazards and we have a pretty good understanding of what to expect in different locations. You can see, uh, you know, nothing surprising on the left side, but these areas are also uh, experiencing significant seismic risk and they need to be aware of that and prepare for that. But this is not new. This, is, this has been known for at least 20 to 30 years. Similar advances has been made in uh, uh, other hazards. This is a hurricane example from the American Society of Civil Engineers. This is part of the design code now. You can look at uh, different levels of design wind speeds that are based on simulated hurricanes and we have methods available they are not used by ASC yet but methods are available to consider the impact of climate change the rise in sea level temp sea temperatures and how that affects hurricanes so we can have a changing intensity of hurricanes as we advance into the future and we, we already kind of understand how that will affect uh, the east coast of the US or, or the Asia and Pacific area with typhoons there. And there are other hazards similarly well understood. So this part is, is doing great. Now, if we know the hazard, but we know that we live in the area and we are exposed to it, we can think about retreat, but oftentimes retreat is very difficult, especially politically. And there are many good reasons not to just uh, move people out of entire cities. So instead of that, engineers try to cope with it through recognizing the vulnerability of buildings and avoiding those vulnerabilities through advanced design or, or improved uh, design codes, stronger buildings. There are a few examples here just to show you what, what are typical things that, that are available, that became available really in the last 50 years, I would say. Maybe elevated structures were here before that. Elevated structures avoid flooding, right? Flood-related damages by moving the structure a little higher, avoiding basements, and then basically dodging uh, uh, the inundation. Base isolation is a very similar concept in the earthquake world where you decouple the building from, from the ground. So only part of the shaking is experienced by the building and then essentially you are saving the structure from most of the dynamic excitation. Another option for seismic or, or wind loads are dampers and braces that can dissipate the energy of, of uh, the dynamic excitation and then preserve the other parts of the structure uh, and make them undamaged. And then the last example I have here are window protection systems for hurricanes, avoid breaking the windows, avoid pressurizing the inside of the building. And by that, of course, avoid uh, significant damage and, and loss of life. So these are all great systems and big improvements over what was available. But the problem is that these work very well with new construction. Existing buildings, are expensive to retrofit with them. And for example, base isolation is only used in retrofit scenarios for historical structures or high value buildings. And those are very expensive projects. Why is this a problem? Because we have a lot of existing buildings. We are looking at uh, New York here and everything that is not yellow on the screen was built before the time of these modern uh, engineering ideas and modern design codes. There's a lot of things that are not yellow. What do we do about those, right? We, can, we don't have the funds to retrofit them, all of them. And uh, if we do not do something about them, we will, we will have a problem the next time an, a big extreme event comes. In Brooklyn, for example, you have a significant storm surge hazard. So in the Southern part of Brooklyn, there are many buildings with basements, with critical uh, uh, facilities in the basements, generators. If that part is flooded, it's not that people will get their lives appended because the building is damaged, but they won't have electricity, they won't have water. There are all of these problems and it's, there's no quick fix, there's no easy solution. And this is not limited to New York. 
if you look at 50 cities in the United States and focus on the dark blue bars, you can see that only that portion of the building stock in those cities were built in the modern uh, design era. So everything else was built before those uh, new ideas, before those engineering solutions were available. All of those buildings will need to be at least evaluated. Not all of them are vulnerable, of course. Some buildings are going to do fine, but we need to know which ones are vulnerable and how much it costs to, to repair them and how to prioritize those repairs. After disasters, usually there's a strong push for, for certain kinds of retrofits. And, and there are some good examples in, in San Francisco and Los Angeles in the last 30 years, after the two major earthquakes they had in 1989 and 1994, there were some political will and public support for, for these retrofits. So San Francisco retrofitted soft story buildings. You can see the kind of damage that was experienced there in those buildings. And uh, Los Angeles retrofitted both soft story and non-ductile concrete buildings. So there, there were some nice accomplishments there, but in San Francisco, for example, the non-ductile concrete buildings are still not retrofitted. And that's a major risk there. It's just that even though we know that they are a problem, they are costly to retrofit. And there are many different players uh, that need to be convinced for this to happen. So it's not easy and it's not possible to retrofit everything. So NSF recognizes that one of the grand challenges today is to develop new strategies and new sustainable interventions that can help us fix this problem without just thinking about retrofitting buildings. We need to think about other ways, potentially accepting that our cities will be damaged. And we think about increasing the capacity in our communities to deal with that damage and to rebound from it. That's resilience in essence. And to do that, there are four main challenges. Each of them requires significant work. First, we need to be able to deal with the big data that is generated about our cities. There's a lot of new data, but we don't have a way to parse them and, and maintain them and continually update them as it is generated to describe our cities in great detail. Once that is available, we need new models in engineering that can work with that data to provide higher fidelity damage simulations so that we understand truly what happens with each building in the city. And that way we can understand what are the key vulnerabilities, what are the opportunities to avoid that kind of damage. And more importantly, after the damage is available, we need to move beyond the damage and develop models that can quantify the socioeconomic impact. So it's not just the damage, but what happens to the people? How many of them will be displaced? How will the hospitals cope with, with, the, with the injured? after the disaster and what will happen in the next few years. And finally, we need to be able to measure this and communicate this very well with the general population and also with the decision makers so that they can develop policies that will be supported broadly. And that way we can change how our cities will respond. But this, these tasks are not something that a research group can tackle. This requires large-scale collaboration, true collaboration, where you share your models, where you share your data, and you try to, to work on this together, not just in a city, but internationally. Because the US is quite well off in terms of uh, preparedness and, and strategizing compared to many developing countries. They would benefit a lot from receiving the kind of models and the kind of expertise that is developed here and if it is received for free and with guidance, then, then we can expect fewer uh, events like Turkey and fewer events like Pakistan, because they will be better prepared. They will, they will understand their risks. For this reason, the National Science Foundation created the Natural Hazards Engineering Research Infrastructure, which is a collection of projects looking at experimental facilities, supercomputing resources, uh, post-disaster reconnaissance work and computer simulation. I am involved in the computer simulation part at uh, UC Berkeley. And uh, this is a nine year project right now with a quite likely extension for another 10 years. So it's a huge undertaking by the National Science Foundation. Hundreds of millions of dollars are spent on these projects with the idea to help 
foster that large scale collaboration and build a community, not only in civil engineering, but in disaster science in general. I want to acknowledge that this is a large team, the Sim Center team for computational modeling. I'm only one of them. And what I'm going to present is the work of the entire team, not just my own. Our mandate is to develop the next generation of regional disaster simulation tools, and not only develop these tools, but also educate the community on how to use them. So the idea is that we would create a shared platform with tools and models and data that everybody can share and use. And this way, we are bringing everybody together to speak the same language and to use the same, uh, same ideas and same models and same innovation, innovative uh, components in their work so people can exchange and share what they have. We achieve this by creating a modular uh, framework. I have an earthquake example here to, to walk you through it. We first identify the key components. These are the colored boxes of getting from understanding the buildings or the inventory all the way until damage and loss uh, simulation. We need to also know something about the hazard or the event itself. And we need to have a way to describe how structures will respond to that event. And then if I wanted to, we could go deeper and disaggregate this into individual components. Basically, we are creating a vocabulary and a standard way to think about the problem. And then within that vocabulary, we define different levels of fidelity because sometimes you don't have enough data. Not everybody has access to detailed BIM models of every building, but those who do, they might want to use higher fidelity models than those who don't. And we want all of these models to live in the same ecosystem so that they become comparable. You can run benchmarks. You can say the benefits of using a higher fidelity model is this and that, but if you don't have it, then, then you still have these or those advantages. And this applies to describing an inventory, this applies to describing events, applies to simulating structural behavior and simulating damage and losses. All of those steps have multiple options across multiple hazards. This is an earthquake example, but we have a puzzle piece figure to show that we are not limited to earthquakes. Each of these puzzle pieces can be exchanged to other puzzle pieces. So when you think about describing the hazard, you can describe an earthquake, you can describe a hurricane, or you can describe a flood event. And as long as your inventory uh, supports it, you can use the same inventory for all of those events. That's the idea. This makes it much faster to prototype new ideas and to, to expand them to different locations, transfer something from the US to another country, for example. This is in essence what we are developing. We have multiple test beds where we are creating regional scale simulations, providing the data, providing data about the inventory, data about the hazard. And these are kind of sandboxes, if you will, where you can bring your own ideas. You can use the models that we already have, but you can bring your own model and compare it. Compare what your model brings to the table. How is it improving certain aspects of uh, the assessed risk or, or the included uncertainty? This is a good way, again, to build a community around these efforts. For example, just to show you what is included in these test beds right now, one of our first test beds is the Bay Area uh, earthquake scenario. This is San Francisco, and uh, this is the East Bay where we simulate a magnitude seven earthquake on the Hayward Fault. And we look at how it impacts almost 2 million buildings. And each building has its own description with metadata, its own finite element model that is shaken by a time history. And we look at the damages and the losses for each building and then aggregate it across uh, the area. We use idealized models here. You know, this problem is not yet solved, but what we wanted to show is that the framework is capable of doing this. And what is also remarkable and is important to recognize is that as long as you use idealized models, the runtime is not significant. This is not a huge computational problem until you only want to run one simulation. So it takes about two hours if you have enough cores because it's embarrassingly parallel. You can run each building separately until you only want to get the damage, it's easy. Once you go into socioeconomic impact, you are looking at systems. And when you are looking at systems, it doesn't scale that well. So that's an important part. But as long as you are only focusing on the damage, you can do a lot uh, since you are 
uh, you have access to high performance computing. This design safe uh, resource is freely available to everyone in the United States. So if you want to run these simulations, I encourage you to check, uh, check out this opportunity because you can get thousands of cores for free and run these uh, large scale simulations and see how your models and your ideas help. A, a key improvement that we have here, and I already mentioned this, is that looking at conventional methods, we used to have aggregated information. They used to have information in census tracts or in counties, and an average impact was described because that, that, that's how they dealt with the, the data scarcity. There was no information about every single building, so they used census data to have a rough idea about what will happen in each census tract. And this is great. This is great uh, to have a big picture understanding, but it's not enough to design interventions. It's not enough to design policies that focus on specific kind of vulnerabilities in buildings. So we want to move from this aggregate idea towards a high resolution uh, approach that you can see here. For this high resolution approach, we need a high amount of data, new data that is not yet collected. Census doesn't provide you information about the features of every building, about the soil and the terrain around every building for, for wind simulation, about specific design details that might uh, represent vulnerabilities or might protect you against certain kind of vulnerabilities. We don't know about households. That, that is extremely difficult because the data on households is sensitive. We will probably never know. It's not just about not being able to collect it, but it's that we should not collect it at all. So how do we deal with this infrastructure? That's a, that's a national security concern, right? How do, you, how do you get and use data about critical infrastructure without exposing your nation, not just the US, any nation to uh, harm? These are important and difficult questions. I am not going to be able to, to answer all of them, but I can present you what we did when it comes to buildings. Buildings are easier. There's no sensitivity there. We just don't know how to collect all that data. So what we came up with is an augmented parcel approach where we start with whatever data is available and we have two steps to enhance it. So what is available? We have footprints usually for almost every structure in the US. There are multiple data sets actually, hundreds of millions of footprints freely available. We also have tax assessor data that's limited to the United States, but at least in the United States, you have that publicly available because of property taxes. That, those data sets provide some information, but because tax assessors are not structural engineers, they don't really collect the kind of information that we are interested in. So for example, structural system is not recorded. And that's where the problems start. Some of the data can be inferred from images. This is the first step that we do. We use computer vision-based techniques. I will show you some of those satellite images and street view images to extract information such as the number of floors or some geometric details about the buildings. But some other pieces of information like the year of construction or the structural system is not easy to infer. People can change the facade of the building, but that doesn't change the internal structure, which is the most important uh, part. So for those, we use statistical inference techniques. When it comes to computer vision, we have a, we have a Python package called Rails that we are developing. This is a collection of machine learning modules, each developed to infer a particular feature of the building, and it's open. So others in the community can contribute their own ideas, and we are looking at building a library of machine learning modules so that when you want to build a building inventory, you don't need to be a machine learning expert. You just go to Braille's and you say, I need these features at this location. And you will see if there are modules that are available and perform well at that location, and you can just apply them automatically and extract, create a building inventory for yourself there. So let me give you a few examples of the kind of things that we can do with Braille's already. One of them is geometric details. That's, that's kind of a, a straightforward application. If you think about looking at a building, uh, measuring certain, certain sizes there seems to be quite straightforward. You look at the location, pull the street view and satellite image, and then using the street view image, you can uh, manipulate the image in a way to get a front view 
on the facade. And then if you look at the top view, you can measure the length of this eave on the roof. And you know that that length is exactly the same as this length here. So after segmentation, you can understand this is the roof, this, this is the, the facade, these are the windows, and you can measure the height and everything else relative to that roof length. And this way, you get a pretty good idea about all of the different geometric details in the building. And this works quite well. One of the great things that we can infer with this is the first floor height that is very important for flood-related risk assessment, as you can imagine, because that's where the water enters the building. And some buildings have pretty significant first floor heights, six feet even. So it really changes the flood risk in the East Coast. Another uh, uh, type of model that we do is a classifier kind of models where we have a certain number of uh, uh, options. In this case, we are looking at roof types, flat, gable, and hip roof. And we use satellite images, train a classifier on them, and then new images can be put into the right classes if the, if the classifier works well. As you can see here with the confusion matrix looking at predicted versus the ground truth, we have overall over 90% accuracy with these, which is not perfect. Of course, we never get to 100%, but this is giving you a pretty good baseline for, for targeted uh, risk assessment, high resolution, where you see that certain neighborhoods have certain kinds of construction that make them more vulnerable to that particular type of hazard. The third example I, I have here is an object detection based model. Here we are looking at the building and searching for windows and doors and use that to identify floors. This is helpful for shorter and mid-rise buildings. Of course, high rises don't have a street view image that would capture the whole building, so it cannot really get the, the number of floors for those. But for these shorter buildings, it can differentiate between single story, two story and three story buildings that, for example, in earthquakes have a significantly different response. So if you look at a suburb, you can see the kind of construction in different areas. And again, you can identify which areas might be more vulnerable than others. And the performance here, again, is close to 90%. Even with images in the wild, in the wild means that we are not selecting those where you can actually see the facade. Sometimes the street view images have trees in front of them, which make it much more difficult to, to infer these details. When you have a clean data set, you are looking at 95%. So that's a really good uh, performance. Now, after all of these computer vision-based enhancement, there are still some gaps that remain, as I mentioned. For example, structure type, year of construction, and things like that. For those, we can do two things. One of them is uh, making use of the similarity between different buildings. That could be spatial proximity. You can imagine that certain neighborhoods are developed together, for example. So you can assume that if there's a neighborhood where you already know some buildings, and you know that those buildings were built at the same time, you can assume that the nearby buildings are also built at the same time. This is not perfect, but, but it's better than not knowing anything about the buildings. Similar arguments can be made about certain other types of, of uh, features, structure type also. If you have a development in a certain area, you know some structures are the same type. Of course, the others are, have a high probability of being in the same type. So that's the similarity-based approach. We also have rule sets that require a good information about the year of construction and then use an understanding of the design codes in each era and assume that buildings were designed to code and by that can assume certain structural details and, and uh, construction details uh, as they evolve over time. So if a building was designed in 1950, we cannot expect a high level of, of resistance, but if it was designed in 2010, it's a whole different story. And we developed a couple of rule sets already. You can see these are well, these look rather simple, but there's a lot of rules and a lot of years and you know, a lot of work behind it, understanding the design practice and, of course, compliance with design. In the, even in the U.S., you would be surprised uh, that certain states have much lower compliance than 100%. And that needs to be considered. It's not enough to assume that everybody follows the design. And it's not only today, but you have to understand the compliance history, right? We have to know how was it in 1980, how was it in 1960. So we did a lot of work in uh, Louisiana and uh, uh, New Jersey already, and we intend to develop different rule sets for every single uh, state 
in the US. And that way, again, you don't need to be an expert in this. You can just take the rule set, as long as you trust uh, the work that we put into this, apply it and plug in the gaps in your building inventory, assuming that uh, the buildings follow the typical design practice in the area. These are, by the way, simple Python scripts with heavy documentation so that you always know what is happening. That's also a very important part of everything that that's to support large scale collaboration, you need to be able to document your work so that others can trust it. Otherwise it's not going to be reused in other settings. So at the end of the day, we arrive at, at a, an extended building inventory, but as I mentioned, there's still some uncertainty. Sometimes you, you don't have a clear answer for, for certain building features, but you say that there's about 40% chance that it's like this and 60% chance that it's like that. And the, the fewer information you have about the buildings, the more uncertainty that generates in your building inventory. In order to incentivize better data collection, we need to propagate this uncertainty and show how it impacts our capability to describe the risk. If we have a lot of uncertainty in the inputs, we will have a lot of uncertainty about the risk. And if we are able to communicate that, people will see that that, is, that has a crippling effect. You don't really cannot make decisions if you don't know what, how the hazard or the, or the disaster will affect the city. So uncertainty, quantification and propagation is essential, but this presents another set of problems. This is the same slide I showed you before about the data, but now you can imagine that each of these data sources is not only missing data, but once you plug in what's missing, you will have a ton of uncertainty there. And the higher fidelity your simulations become, the more uncertainty you will have because you don't have the data to support them. We can hope that collecting uh, more data will help us, but they, it is not going to help us in two years or in five years. So what can we do? What we do now is propagate these uncertainties using Monte Carlo analysis. I assume most of you are familiar with it, but just in case you are not, it's a simple technique where you run the same simulation multiple times, each time with different realizations of the random variables. So if you don't know, for example, the structure type, you throw a dice and then Sometimes it's going to be this type, sometimes it's going to be that type. But it's not just one structure type, it's usually millions of variables. Each of them will have its own realization. And then you run the simulation multiple times. So you get this map of damage, and then you get another map of damage, and then you get a lot more. And all of these describe your uncertainty about the results. That's the idea. The problem is the computational challenge here, because we need thousands of simulations now to be able to, to describe this. And if we also want to bring in the high fidelity models that I talked about earlier, and all of this extra data to support them, we will be talking about simulations that would take years to do on a laptop. Of course, we are not doing them on a laptop, but as I mentioned, it doesn't scale very well after a certain number of cores. So it's not possible to just throw 100,000 cores at it and then get it solved. And this is where surrogate models come into the picture. I will give you an example to help, uh, help with uh, explaining what surrogate models are in case you are not familiar with them. This is a structural response example, but surrogates are not limited to structural response. Structural response estimation is one of the uh, very demanding parts of these simulations. That's why we first start with that, but you can apply the same concept on hazard uh, simulations or uh, network performance simulations, for example. What is the concept? The concept is that you start with some input parameters in a structural response case. This is an earthquake uh, uh, example. We are looking at uh, the description of a structure. You can look at a building or a bridge. There are multiple parameters of that structure. You can imagine that. And then there's also a ground motion, ground shaking uh, that also has a several parameters. So those are your inputs. And then you do that expensive dynamic analysis to get the outputs which are going to be displacements and accelerations on every floor of the structure. So mathematically, this looks like uh, an array of inputs and an array of outputs. And you have multiple of those arrays because you do uncertainty quantification. Each time you have a little different input because the inputs are uncertain. And then, of course, you will get a different output. All right. So this is the problem. Now, traditionally, you would use dynamic analysis to do this task, but this is too slow. That's what we want to replace. So what we can do is that first we generate 
training data uh, for these simulations. This can be done in an embarrassingly parallel setting because each of those columns is independent. So you just generate a lot of possible inputs and then use a supercomputer to get the outputs for them. And you can use this training data to replace your simulation with a, with a surrogate. A surrogate is just a mathematical model that tries to understand the patterns in the output. So use the inputs and some theta parameters to approximate the outputs. And we do that by minimizing the difference between the training output and the surrogate model output. You know, superficially, this seems very simple. And once it's done, it can replace your expensive model and apply on new inputs. That's the key here. So you can have your own new inputs, but now your surrogate will be able to approximate the outputs and save you a lot of time. We have a case study here where we looked at a 12 story building and what you can see the orange colors are the reference outputs from expensive analysis and the gray are the surrogate model outputs. Drifts, so displacements and accelerations across 12 floors in two directions and you can see how well they match and the surrogate is orders of magnitude faster than the original. Now, you can also see that they are not only matching in the marginal distributions, but even the joint distribution of displacement and acceleration is properly captured. That means we can see the dependencies between these different variables, which is very important when you are looking at uh, response estimation. And this is a 48 dimensional space where the fitting was performed. So it's very promising. This is a single building. We are far from being able to say we have a surrogate for reinforced concrete buildings, any size, any location, right? That we are not there yet. But this is, we believe, a very, very promising path. Now, the Sim Center provides a bunch of tools to help people develop these models more quickly, starting from a general purpose optimization tool that is not limited to hazards or, or structural response, all the way to damage and loss simulation. And the idea is that you, would, you could use these tools to develop these surrogates and then apply them at a regional risk setting. We have another tool for that. All of these tools can run small jobs on your local laptop and intensive jobs on a supercomputer without you having to change anything in your setup or in your application. This is just a quick uh, view on one of our desktop applications for earthquake engineering. You can see that it's very pragmatic. It's not designed to have a sexy user interface. It's just about putting in the data that you need giving you some feedback in terms of uh, charts and figures, and then running the analysis, giving, giving you the outputs. When it comes to regional scale simulations, our application has a built-in QGIS engine, so you can work with spatial data more conveniently. You can visualize your results. Uh, that helps a lot. We already support earthquakes, hurricanes, and tsunamis in this application. All right, I have just a few slides left to talk about um, what's coming next. So. Until this point, we believe we have a pretty good handle on how to get to high fidelity damage estimates. We are not there yet, but we have the framework developed. The next challenge that we see is modeling socioeconomic impact and recovery. So connecting these damage estimates and engineers with social scientists and their models, and then merging those two so that we have a seamless transition and the description of what happens in years after the disaster. There are a few good examples already. Uh, I'm showing uh, results from work with Rodrigo Costa, who worked with us at Stanford. This is an example of getting more data about, uh, about uh, the households. We are, this is a model that uh, captures the minimum income of households in San Francisco, which is normally not available. And of course, these are approximate values, but they are very valuable if they are good approximations because you can use them to describe the coping capacity of households after an earthquake. And then using other data sources, workforce availability, that kind of financing that might be available to people, you can simulate many different trajectories of recovery in the years after the disaster. And you can use this to discuss questions like the number of workforce that is, a, that is needed to recover this city because there is significant number of external workers that need to come to help. We are talking about six to 12,000 people. 
to help recover that city. Or you can look at which demographics are good indicators of people who or households who will be heavily affected by the disaster. And some surprising ones come out like multifamily dwellings. If you live in a multifamily housing, you are much more exposed. You have much higher risk than if you live in a single family home, for example. So to sum it up, we looked at natural uh, hazard events and the risk involved. We see that it's increasing and how NSF is responding by fostering large-scale collaboration. The Sim Center develops this shared computational platform, and I've shown you how we use it to develop higher resolution inventories, quantify the uncertainty using surrogate models to arrive at high resolution damage estimates, and then go into the future looking at socioeconomic models and better understanding the impact on our communities rather than just on the structures themselves. And with that, I thank you and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Adam. Um, we have five minutes for questions. So, so you have some questions first. Uh, do, you, do you want to use this? Up to you. Okay. I don't really see collaborations here, right? So the first thing is I don't really understand why the image is actually very helpful. And what type of uncertainties that you actually quantify for what roles? So you mentioned that the goal is to perform the community. If I'm the goal is for the community, why I hear about just one beauty one apartment. Also, if I just hear about one beauty one apartment, but I first want to know how many people are living there and there's an insurance plan already there telling me what's the risk. Of my community, of my apartment. So, so I, I'm just thinking aloud here. I'm just thinking about like, what is the goal here? Because you're talking about hazard, you're talking about vulnerabilities. So, you quantify vulnerability or quantify hazard, or, or you're talking about exposure. If that's the risk goal, it's your, your central goal. But I don't see collaborations in here that connecting all these three dots together. So, that's the, the, that's the central question here. Okay, I, I, I will try to answer shortly. There's, there's a lot of things there. Uh, the goal is definitely the risk. It's not exposure, it's not just the vulnerability. That's, that's the very thing that uh, I was trying to convey that if you focus on only one part, it's not going to tell the whole story. And if you focus on only one building, that's not going to tell the whole story. So I agree with you, one apartment is not interesting for a decision maker and it shouldn't be. And one, even one household is not interesting. It's, it's the collection of every building and every household and the systems that are in place. And we are not there yet. We, we cannot simulate urban systems and their response to damage in a disaster. We don't be at the same center, definitely don't have it. Perhaps some private companies have it, but publicly available methods are not available for, for large scale simulations like this. So that's a missing piece. To achieve this, insurance companies use crude models. They have ideas about the risk, but those ideas are approximate. These models are beyond what is available at insurance companies. Of course, they have other needs. They need to have robustness, right? They need to test them. So they have a good reason not to advance as quickly as, as researchers do, because they need to uh, they have skin in the game, right? They, they cannot just replace something with a new model overnight, but they are struggling with the inventory. They are struggling with get, having good models of vulnerabilities, and they are struggling with systemic risks. So they are sharing the same problems. Nobody has a really good idea of, of high resolution risk in our cities. We have some basic understanding of typical buildings that got damaged in previous disasters, and we saw them, but uh, we don't really understand those kinds of vulnerabilities that are in, in structures that have not been exposed to those disasters yet. Earthquakes happen very rarely, for example. So there could be structures in San Diego, or there could be structures in Seattle that have not been exposed to significant earthquakes, and we better recognize that before the earthquake happens, because after that, of course, we will know quite well, but it will be a little too late. So that's for the risk part. You asked, asked about collaborations also. Well, well I, think, I think the key thing is that you should sort of go to the risk, right? So, and I don't really see the research that you're talking about that leads to that. And uh, especially you said the risk of three components. One is the risk, one is the hazard, 
I see a little bit of hazard part, but I didn't see the vulnerability part, and I didn't see the exposure part. And, and how they all these things in the metric of risk, and I just don't really see the metric of risk either. So, and, uh, and third is that, um, and, and also remember this, this, uh, this picture, um, this, uh, this component about uh, using images, and, 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 and I don't really understand how that actually translates to simulating the, uh, the, the buildings, because I mean, how can you understand material structure? I think it's, the, it's, it's a very um, high up there, and it's really just not connect. And then that's where we give rise to the doubt of the collaboration, because I don't really see how things are connected to the collaboration. The images help with the exposure, right? Understanding your building stock, understanding your bridges, understanding the features of those beyond just saying that there's a structure there. Right now, what you have is a footprint and maybe, maybe the year of construction for, for the United States, for example. With these images, you could have much more data about every building. And with that data, you can support models that can give you a better idea of the damage of the building in a given event. So images help with exposure. If you look at this slide, this part is exposure. This part is vulnerability, okay? And then after you have an idea about the damage in the buildings, you need to work, not you, but we need to work with social scientists to understand how to describe the risk. What is the risk that we want to reduce? That doesn't preclude us from improving the damage part because we will need to be able to see which parts of the building dam get damaged? How many floors are not functional after an earthquake? There's a lot, lot of push in the earthquake engineering community to understand how soon can we start using a building, even if it's not completely repaired, because the repairs will take years, but oftentimes you can get back and start using it. These are details that need damage information to be able to, to have numbers and measurable uh, descriptions. That's, that's where these things are connected. So we have vulnerability related developments, we have exposure related developments, and the hazard side, honestly, is pretty well developed. What we need there is more granular information about the local conditions, soil conditions, terrain, these kinds of things. Uh, that's how everything gets connected. And you, you mentioned that you don't see the collaboration, but which Part of like if it's an open framework and everybody can use it and contribute to it, uh, what 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 do you not see? So let's let's stop here because we are already two minutes over. Um, you know, feel free to reach out to me or Adam uh, for for more questions. I want to be conscious of, of your meetings coming up. Um, thank you for you know this presentation. You covered. Quite, uh, quite some breath, I understand. It's hard to go into very details within 45 minutes. So thank you for offering us uh, uh, all of these capabilities that Mary has. Let's, uh, let's thank our speaker and uh, see you next week, Friday. Thank you, thank you.